Well, let's go ahead and get started. Um, uh, welcome to our briefing today, Back to School, Catalyzing Climate Action in K-12 Schools. I'm Dan Brissett. I'm the Executive Director of the Environmental and Energy Study Institute. And I'm joined here today by many of my colleagues. Uh, some are out at the table, some are here in the room. So if you see anybody wearing a pin like this and you have broader questions about climate change topics that you would like to have answered or, or anything like that, please feel free to track us down and we look forward to the networking opportunity afforded by an in-person congressional briefing. Um, we're on Capitol Hill today. We have an in-person audience. We're also webcasting, so we have an online audience as well. Really, really excited about being up here uh, and you know all of, the, all of the fun dynamics that you can really only get uh, at an in-person event. I'd like, to, um, I'd like to start by thanking uh, three members of Congress who are our sponsors for today. I'd like to thank Representative Scott, Chairman Scott, Representative Tonko uh, and Representative Pingree for all of the work that they put into helping us uh, pull off today's session. Um, EESI uh, was founded in 1984 on a bipartisan basis by members of Congress to provide uh, policymaker educational resources uh, to Congress, members of Congress and their staff about environmental and energy topics. And in 1988, our focus was, was narrowed even more and also broadened uh, to climate change. And so since then, that's what we've been focused on. Briefings are uh, a big part of what we do, but they're not all of the, what we do. Um, in addition to our federal policy work, we also work with rural utilities that are working to improve access and affordability for energy efficiency and electrification. We do uh, articles and issue briefs and fact sheets and podcasts and meetings and all sorts of additional forms of educational resources and everything uh, that we produce uh, is available for free online at www.esi.org. If you haven't already checked it out, um, my guess is that there's something there that you would find interesting uh, on a topic that you're tracking or your boss is tracking. And the best thing to do to keep up with all of our work is to subscribe to our biweekly newsletter, which is called Climate Change Solutions. The latest issue was yesterday. We had a lot of coverage of the Kigali Amendment ratification in the Senate, something that we, were, we really welcomed, something that was long overdue. Uh, but we also had other uh, articles about other climate change topics. So um, uh, it's a, a great resource. The one right after Labor Day was all about IRA programs and with a specific emphasis on those that will benefit rural areas. Um, I like to do a couple plugs at the top of our briefings uh, just so that everybody knows what's coming up next. Uh, the next four briefings we have will be focused on the UNFCCC, the United Nations uh, Framework Convention on Climate Change, uh, 27th Conference of Parties, so COP27, you might be reading about that. Uh, we're going to do four briefings starting October 12th on key findings from the newest global assessment report on climate change, natural climate solutions, climate change loss and damage, and what's on the table for negotiations. You can sign up for the whole series at once. Uh, and the best way to do that is to visit us online at www.esi.org forward slash sign up. It's going to be really, really good. And then after COP, we're going to have a recop where we're gonna do a briefing where we can look back and try to figure out what all of that means for, uh, for Congress uh, in particular. How do we, how to, what are the kinds of policies and investments needed for the United States to live up to our international commitments? But today, uh, we are all about schools, uh, all about ca uh, catalyzing climate action in K through 12 schools. And we have uh, four tremendous panelists uh, join us today. Um, in addition to our briefing, uh, we have a little bit of a field trip after. Um, uh, we're going to go uh, at 4.30. We're going to walk down and check out an electric school bus, an actual a retrofitted electric school bus or repowered electric school bus. It used to be powered on diesel. Now it runs on electricity. So if you want to do that, stick around and we'll lead a delegation down to over by the Botanic Gardens on Maryland Avenue. Um, but before we get to that, we're going to have our panelists. Schools, um, I think most of us attended school uh, or had some interaction with school, or who had parents who went to school, or drive by a school, or see kids waiting for the bus. Schools are parts of our communities. Uh, they're educational uh, institutions, but they're also community centers. They're places where people gather. They host events. They're really, really important parts of our community. Um, they provide community resilience. They provide sustainability. Uh, they're opportunities to be good stewards of our environment. Uh, and they provide hands-on learning, like going to visit electric school buses. And our four panelists today will cover climate action in K through 12 schools from different perspectives. They'll talk about electrification. They'll talk about building energy efficiency and resilience. They'll take, talk about food waste. And I think across the presentations, there'll be a strong through line of how we can do all of those things in an equitable way 
uh, so that students of all backgrounds and all geographies have an opportunity to the same learning experiences. So with that, I'm going to introduce uh, our, one of our hosts for today, uh, Representative Chelly Pingree. In 2008, Representative Pingree was elected to Congress from Maine's first congressional district. She was the first woman elected to Congress from that district. She's previously served on the House Rules Committee and Armed Services Committee. She currently sits on the House Appropriations Committee, chairing the Subcommittee on Interior and the Environment, and sitting on the Subcommittee on Agriculture and Subcommittee on Military Construction and Veterans Affairs. She's also a member of the House Agriculture Committee. She's a former Maine state senator and a small uh, state, state Senate majority leader. She's a farmer and a small business owner, and she's joining us today by pre-recorded marks to welcome everyone to our briefing. Hi, I'm Congresswoman Shelley Pingree. Everyone joining us here today has one very important thing in common. We want to ensure a habitable planet now and for future generations. That's why I came to Congress, and I take comfort in knowing that there are so many dedicated people who are united in that mission. From farming practices to food waste, you can't talk about the climate crisis without talking about our food system. Food loss and waste has a significant greenhouse gas footprint. The production, transportation, and handling of food generates significant carbon dioxide emissions, and when food ends up in landfills, it generates methane, a potent greenhouse gas. This connection between food waste and our changing climate is becoming increasingly important. The United States wastes a staggering amount of food. The World Wildlife Fund estimates 360,000 to 530,000 tons of food is wasted in American schools each year, costing the federal government as much as 1.7 billion annually and emitting almost 2 million metric tons of greenhouse gases. Rather than ending up in landfills, these meals should be feeding our students. The school system offers a tremendous opportunity for students to think outside the box to reduce hunger and cut greenhouse gas emissions. But they need the resources to do so. That's why I introduced the School Food Recovery Act, which would create a grant program to help schools achieve food waste reduction goals. This would encourage schools to pursue, pursue food waste measurement and reporting, prevention, education, and reduction projects. As you know, today the White House is hosting a conference on hunger, nutrition, and health the first government-led conference of its kind in over 50 years. The 1969 Hunger Conference led to transformational legislation to combat hunger in America, creating crucial programs like the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, SNAP, and the Special Supplemental Nutrition Program for Women, Infants, and Children, also known as WIC. But think about how much the world and the hunger crisis has changed since the year we put a man on the moon, 1969. As hunger and malnutrition rates continue to rise, I'm hopeful this 21st century high-level conference will once again spur whole-of-government action to ensure all Americans have reliable access to healthy food and put us closer to our domestic goal to have food loss and waste by 2030. As co-chair of the Bipartisan Food Recovery Caucus, I have long recognized that food waste reduction is a win-win, bringing both environmental and economic benefits. I also introduced the Kids Eat Local Act, a bipartisan bill to allow schools the purchasing flexibility to support local farmers and increase access to local healthy foods in our schools, promoting new business for farmers while providing our children with nutritious lunches made from the ingredients grown in their backyards. This bill can also help reduce on-farm food waste while bringing fresh produce to our schools. I'm proud to use my role as a member of both the House Agriculture Committee and the House Appropriations Subcommittee on Agriculture, Rural Development, Food and Drug Administration to push forward initiatives that increase awareness about food waste and prevention methods. The K-12 through 12 education system offers a great opportunity to work collaboratively with creative educators, school nutrition professionals, and students to both reduce food waste in schools and build lifelong habits that will reduce food loss and waste. Thank you for having me today. 
I'm honored to be your partner as Congre in Congress as we work to build a more sustainable, resilient, and equitable future. Thanks to Representative Pingree and her great staff for helping make her participation possible today. And she ended on a lot of the same notes, sustainable, resilient, equitable, a lot of the themes that our panelists will talk about. In addition to our panelist presentations that you're about to see, uh, we'll also have a question and answer period. So for folks online, um, you can send us an email at ask at a ask at esi.org. That's ASK at esi.org. Send us an email with your question. You also follow us on Twitter at EESI online. For staff in the room, if you have a question when we get there, please raise your hand and we'll come around with a mic and we'll, we'll take your question that way. Um, one last thing, you're about to see four great presentations. If you want to revisit them, this, will be, uh, this webcast will be archived on our website. If you want to review any presentation materials, uh, those will also be posted on the website. So, uh, and we have lots of materials out on the front desk. But without any further ado, I'm going to introduce our first panelist today, Laura Shifter, is a senior fellow with the Aspen Institute's Energy and Environment Program, leading This is Planet Ed, which aims to unlock the power of the education sector to be a force towards climate action, solutions, and environmental justice. Laura is also a lecturer on education with the Harvard Graduate School of Education, where she teaches courses on federal policy and special education. She has served as a senior education and disability advisor for Representative George Miller, who's back there, uh, on the Committee of Education and Labor, and an education fellow for Senator Chris Dodd, in the Senate Health, Education, Labor, and Pensions Committee, in which after she graduated from college, she, was a, she taught elementary school in San Francisco. Laura, welcome to our briefing today. I'm looking forward to your presentation. Great. Um, thank you so much, and thank you to ESI for hosting this briefing and all the sponsors. I do feel slightly nervous about my former boss being uh, over my shoulder, but um, no, really happy to be here to talk about catalyzing climate action in K-12 schools. So just to share with you a little bit about why we started uh, K-12 Climate Action, which is a part of This is Planet Ed several years ago, we recognize that at a systems level, the education sector has not really been vocal in its role in addressing climate change. And likewise, climate solutions often leave out the role that education can play. But there's both a big need and an opportunity to engage the education sector in the fight on climate change. There's a need because with nearly 100,000 schools across the country, our schools are among the largest consumers of energy in the public sector. Um, they operate the largest mass transit fleet in the public sector with 480,000 school buses. They serve 7 billion meals a year annually, often in communities. They're the largest real estate owners, largest employers. Our schools are really large public sector. And as public entities, they need the support of policy to decarbonize and transition. Um, and there's also a critical opportunity. With 50 million Americans enrolled in our public schools, as we decarbonize, as we integrate climate solutions into students' lived experience, that help get, helps give them the opportunity to engage with climate solutions firsthand um, and empower them to be the leaders in a sustainable future ahead. So recognizing this opportunity to really help support the education sector in understanding its role in addressing climate change um, two years ago, we launched the K-12 Climate, Climate Action Commission, which is co-chaired by former Education Secretary John King and former Governor and EPA Administrator uh, Christine Todd Whitman. We brought together leaders across the education field, climate researchers, students, um, people on the ground to really come together to learn about the needs and opportunities to engage the education sector um, on issues related to climate change. And I'll just, uh, next we have a short video from our commissioners talking about why this issue matters to them. As an educator and as the father of two daughters, I worry a lot about the world that we are leaving our young people. It is a world deeply damaged by our reliance on fossil fuels. And the question is, how do we move forward from here? I can't imagine a future for my daughter where she doesn't have access or opportunities um, to connect with the land the same way I did because of climate change. I realize that if I want my daughters to be able to have the choice uh, to live in South Florida 30, 40, 50 years from now, we're going to have to take action. When I served as mayor of New Orleans, I witnessed the impact of climate change directly. It came with the increasing intensity 
of hurricanes and floods. When I see the climate crisis, I see it putting so much pressure and weight on people's ability to just like exist as they are. We know that the impact on the environment has a real significant uh, impact on children's ability to learn. This is the moment where we have to make a decisive commitment to create the cleaner future that can stave off the worst impacts of climate change. Inequity is the challenge of our lifetime, and the only way that we're going to overcome these inequities in our society is through the future leaders that we have in schools. I am very concerned about climate change, and I recognize that schools offer us a huge opportunity. The uh, education establishment is a very large industry, and there's a lot that can be done. In the places I'm from, quality climate education could make such a difference in people's lives. and. I would really love to make that happen in my lifetime. Public schools can prepare and have to prepare our kids for the high wage, high skilled jobs in a new clean economy. Our students are our future. The leaders of tomorrow are being educated in our classrooms today. Why would we not want them involved in the climate dialogue right now? bit of an overview of some of the perspectives of our commissioners and really what drove them to this work. Um, so can we, there we go. So our commission really focused on four primary areas in which schools can take action on climate change. We thought about mitigation and what our education sector needs to do to reduce its environmental footprint, adaptation and how our schools can adapt and build resilience to climate impacts ahead, education, opportunities to support to teaching and learning um, to help students understand climate change and climate solutions. Um, and thinking about all of this through a lens of equity, recognizing the disparate impacts that both climate change and education inequities have on communities of color, under-resourced uh, urban and rural communities, and thinking about how we can center those perspectives in the work ahead. Our commission held a listening tour to hear from people on the ground around what was going on in communities all across the country. Um, and we heard about lots of different opportunities. We heard about districts switching to renewable energy, that top one's Dallas, switching to new renewable energy and saving the school district a million dollars each year. We heard about students pushing their schools, uh, school boards to pass clean energy resolutions. And those clean energy resolutions resolutions passing unanimously. We heard about New York City and Montgomery County right over here committing to transition their electric, uh, or their currently diesel school bus fleet all to electric. And one of the things that we saw, which was really um, interesting, is school districts moving in a direction of developing climate action plans. A lot of our jurisdictions, school districts are separate jurisdictions than cities, um, and cities across the country have developed these climate action plans. School districts are a little bit behind, and we've started to see some school districts developing those climate action plans. Last year, our commission released an action plan uh, with recommendations for what local school districts, state governments, federal government can do to really help support schools in taking action on climate change. And one of the grounding features of the recommendations in the action plan, which we have some copies of outside too, um, is to really support local school districts in developing these climate action plans. It provides an opportunity for them to create a central place and planning mechanisms to do things around mitigation, adaptation, education, and equity, um, and really drive work all together. So a key recommendation is that local school districts develop these climate action plans. And one of the federal policy recommendations that we have is the opportunity for the federal government to provide support for school districts in developing these climate action plans. I think the federal government's done a great job in providing some opportunities for school districts to access funding um, on areas like electric school buses that we'll hear about soon, but this could create a centralized place where school districts can develop a plan, leverage funding from different resources, and really help mobilize something for action in their communities. So that's uh, a bit about what our schools can do. I look forward to your questions ahead. And I will now shift it back over to you. Nope. I can give the clicker right to Sue. Um, we had a couple people. Thank you, Laura, first of all. That was a great presentation. And um, like you said, you have some reports out on the front table, also available online, yeah. I assume. And um, when we're walking to the school bus, maybe if you have any sort of networking questions for folks in, or from folks in the room, you can sort of uh, talk with Laura a little bit. 
Um, we had a couple of people join us. I just wanted to say a quick couple of quick things. One is we're going to have a Q&A session. So uh, for folks joining us online who didn't hear this before, if you have a question, you can send it to us by email at askask at esi.org. Folks in the room, we're going to have a microphone go around the room. So if you have any questions about what our panelists are talking about or climate action in schools more generally, please feel free to, to start thinking of what that question might be. Um, also, Laura's presentations, Sue's presentations, everybody's presentations, along with the webcast and other materials, will be available online at www.esi.org. So if you missed anything, good news, you didn't miss anything. You can go back and check it out. And in a couple of weeks, we'll have some really great summary notes, too. So you can use that as a resource as you're answering your boss's questions. Um, that brings us to our second panelist, Sue Gander. Sue is the director of the Electric School Bus Initiative at the World Resources Institute. She leads a cross-organizational team in advancing the goal of electrifying the U.S. fleet of 480,000 school buses by 2030 with a focus on equity and inclusion. Prior to WRI, Sue was managing director of policy for the Electrification Coalition, where she led policy and advocacy efforts to electrify transportation at scale. Sue was previously the director of the Energy Infrastructure and Environment Direct Division at the National Government Association, which at one point involved me going to Anchorage with you to do a financing presentation. Uh, and she, and that was for more than a decade, she spearheaded, spearheaded work on transportation, electrification, power sector modernization, and resiliency. Sue, take it away. Great. Thank you, Dan. And um, I want to add my thanks to ESI and to the sponsors and to everyone here um, and online that's listening to this um, and um, bringing attention to um, both the issue of climate change um, as well as the issue of schools and the many ways that you just heard about a little bit from, from Laura about how they can contribute to the solution. Um, I don't think we have to look too far beyond the, the storm that's currently um, bearing down on Florida, um, as well as um, this, this summer and ongoing, the, the heat waves and the floods um, and the wildfires to just remind us about why this work is really so important. Um, so I'm thrilled to say a little bit more about the electric school bus um, portion of this. Um, first, just a little bit more about the World Resources Institute. Um, I'm here as the director of one of our programs, Electric School Bus Initiative, but we're a global think tank um, working across uh, multiple countries with about 1,700 staff. You saw our U.S. director uh, featured on the video earlier, um, so it gives you a taste of it. Um, we're here dedicated to solving some of the world's toughest challenges, um, including climate change. And um, if you want to know who the WRI people are, we're the ones with these little pins that are flashing. If you want one, we'll come talk to you as we walk to the bus. Um, so the Electric School Bus Initiative is, a, is an ambitious, equity-focused, five-year effort. We're supported by the Bezos Earth Fund, and our aim is listed up there. It's to uh, create the unstoppable momentum to electrify equitably the entire school bus fleet. Um, that's important to the more than 20 million kids that ride the bus uh, to school each day, but really to all of us. Um, I do want to acknowledge that we're working um, you know, kind of on the shoulders of many organizations that have been working on this topic for some time. It's like Chispa and Moms Clean Air Force and Mothers Out Front and Sierra Club and, and many others um, that have been, you know, in the trenches um, building the case for this. Um, and we're happy to partner with them um, and continue this work. Really excited to be working with school districts, including Baltimore City, um, with manufacturers, with uh, school bus contractors, utilities, um, financing groups, um, and of course, policymakers like all of you. Um, it's definitely going to take all of us working together um, to tackle this. Um, I'll say a little bit about the decarbonization opportunity. Um, school buses are part of the larger transportation sector, which, as you know, is the leading source of greenhouse gas emissions in this country. And 90% of the current fleet of uh, school buses are diesel that emit more than twice the amount of greenhouse gases as electric school buses. And that's after accounting for those emissions from the grid, which, as we know, thanks to all the great work that's being done on renewables, um, is becoming um, more and more um, carbon free every day. So really excited about that opportunity. But we're also excited about an opportunity of a whole host of other benefits. And I think at the top of this list are things like air quality um, and, um, and health impacts. And we also see um, tremendous opportunity for savings in the fuel and the operation of the buses with something on the order of $4,000 to $11,000 um, savings per year per bus, which can really add up. Um, and then there's opportunities for new green jobs in this sector, which we're excited about as well. I do want to say a little bit more about the air quality and the health impacts. Um, diesel fumes have proven links to some serious physical health issues as well as cognitive developments. And 
Um, the diesel exhaust from the school buses contribute to the ambient pollution more broadly as well. So as these tra buses travel throughout the neighborhoods, um, they're spewing that pollution as well. But in contrast, electric school buses are tailpipe emissions free. Um, another important aspect of the air pollution is the um, the way that it's distributed and how it is um, disproportionately impacting kids from low-income families and communities of color. Um, part of this is because it's those kids that are more likely to be riding the bus because they don't have alternatives um, to bring them to school. Um, and then, you know, on top of that, um, kids with disabilities ride longer on the buses. So thinking about electrifying the entire fleet of school buses is really how we can help address both these health issues as well as the inequities that we're facing. So where are we? Um, we are just beginning in this process. We have the 480,000 school buses. Less than 3% of this are electric, but we're seeing amazing momentum. Um, and you see there, and I'll show later, um, we've got electric school buses um, in 38 states and looking forward to having that number um, grow as we have the investments from um, the various different federal programs and state programs um, coming forward. This uh, curve just indicates how far we've come in a short amount of time from the first school buses that came uh, into operation in 2014 in California, and now we're up to uh, over 12,000, 12,700 electric school buses that we are counting at WRI as either committed, uh, either procured or delivered or in operation. So really excited to see that trend line. Um, the reason for that really dramatic jump there is because um, of repower buses, actually. Um, a group called Sea Electric and Midwest Transit have made a commitment to repower 10,000 school buses over the next five years. So really excited about that. And as you heard, you'll get a chance to see um, a school bus from Unique Electric Solutions and Logan um, Bus Company um, if you join us for our little stroll comes later. Um, this gives you the kind of geographic distribution of buses now. Um, what you'll see is that, you know, they are spread across the country. I think what we think is important here is this shows that electric school buses are of interest and are operating in all sorts of conditions. You have everything from, speaking of Alaska, Hoke, Alaska to Phoenix, Arizona. So all sorts of climates, geographies, um, suburban areas, urban areas, rural areas as well. Um, and i um, excited to see that grow, as I said, as we, as we move forward. So what about supply? Um, we've demonstrated there's definitely some demand there. We see manufacturing scaling up over time. This is a map that shows where some of those locations are and some of the ways that um, companies are expanding. The manufacturers are looking at this demand and increasing the building out there of plants. Um, and a lot of the supply is located increasingly in places in the US or already was here. Um, and we're seeing new, uh, new jobs and, and new um, plants coming into places like Georgia, Illinois, West Virginia. So that's really exciting as part of this momentum as well. And um, one estimate puts the number of jobs coming just from the investments from the bipartisan infrastructure law alone at adding another 40, 46,000 job years um, through the investments in new clean school buses. So very excited about that as well. Um, we're seeing a whole host of new models come online. This is an excerpt from a buyer's guide and market report that we did that just shows how um, there's more and more options available that are going to meet those needs of you know, school districts um, depend, you know, no matter where they are in terms of um, the types of buses that they have or what they're looking for in terms of performance. I'll say a little bit about repowers just so you know a little bit more what it is and the experts who are here can share more. Um, it's really essentially taking an existing vehicle and then replacing the original engine with a new electric drivetrain. Um, some of the advantages there that are attractive are that it can be nearly half the price of a newly manufactured vehicle. Um, they can be put together more quickly. Um, and then you can work that into your existing fleet. So we're excited to see the progress that's being made there. Um, and I'd say we're probably ecstatic, if that was exciting, excited, we're ecstatic about the new federal clean school bus program. And for anyone in this room that was working on that, we wanna say thank you um, for that. It's really been a huge game changer um, as we've dedicated our work to this. Um, as you probably know, there's a um, funding stream of 2.5 billion dedicated solely to electric school buses, and then another 2.5 billion that's allotted for school buses that could include electric. Um, we're really pleased to see how quickly the EPA, who administers this, has worked to move this first round of funding out the door, and um, we're definitely uh, looking forward to continuing to support the program um, and advance both the electric portion as well as the focus on equity. So I'll just briefly either remind or inform folks about what this looks like. So we have the first round of funding 
under the program is coming in the form of a rebate. Um, and this is particularly helpful because that's going to be a really speedy way to get the funds to the school districts. The first application period ended on August 19th. And for well, there are folks in the room like Hannah who are waiting to hear anxiously how that goes, um, we're looking forward in the coming weeks to hearing about the first lottery. Um, and what we're hearing um, about the application process is that there was an overwhelming demand um, for this funding. So um, a great job again on um, seeing where there's a need. Um, and we certainly are looking forward to continuing to work with this program and continue to enhance it as we go forward. Um, there's a pretty substantial amount of funding available for those, um, for, for everyone that applies, but um, the funding tops out at um, a hefty $375,000 per bus with an additional $20,000 um, for infrastructure. Um, really critical to really help move us beyond where we're at now and help us get to scale in the manufacturing so those prices continue to come down. Also exciting as well, and I'm sure for many of you here, um, are what's in the Inflation Reduction Act. I can talk more a little bit about that, but there's a great funding program as well as a really um, um, generous um, tax rebate that allows school districts as tax exempt entities to participate in this as well. And then finally, um, I have to say a word, um, given my roots here in state policy about the state policy momentum, um, it's a great complement to what we're seeing federally. Um, and of note in the last year is the um, start of, um, we'd like to say, a string of transition targets on um, the first one coming from New York that set a 100% new school bus goal um, for sales by 2027 and all school buses transitioned uh, by 2035. And that was followed by uh, Connecticut, Maryland, Maine, um, and a whole host of other policy measures as well that have been really critical to um, just to continue this, um, this progress. Um, and one key piece about many of those funding programs is that they um, prioritize equity and prioritize environmental justice areas in terms of thinking about who is available to get the funding first or get at least a portion of the funding dedicated to them. So um, with that, I will just um, invite you to um, get on board the electric school bus um, movement um, and, and get on board our little, our little walking um, group that's going to go down and see the bus as well. Thank you very much. Thanks, Sue. And just for those who came in a little late, we are going to have a, a walkabout. We're going to walk down uh, to visit an, a repowered electric school bus that's down by the Botanic Gardens, get a chance to, you know, do the wheels go round and round, do the wipers go swish, 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 we'll really, you know, test it out and make sure that this thing is up to snuff. So we're really looking forward to that. Um, there's a flyer uh, about it as well in case you need to, um, with, with some of the list of organizations, including WRB, help make that possible. Uh, our third panelist today is Pete Pearson. Pete is the Senior Director of Food Loss and Waste at the World Wildlife Institute, or excuse me, World Wildlife Fund, leading WWF's work on reducing food loss and waste in schools. Pete works on food waste prevention and food recovery, helping businesses understand the intersection of agriculture and wildlife conservation. For almost a decade, he has been working as a change agent within various businesses and nonprofits on regenerative agriculture, sustainability, and corporate social responsibility. Pete, welcome to the briefing. Thank you to ESSI for having me. Thanks to all of you for being here. And uh, I wanted to start by just telling you how I started my journey. I started with World Wildlife Fund seven years ago uh, and was called upon to create this global program for reducing food loss and waste. WDF's mission is to ensure a future where both people and nature thrive. Uh, that's always been our mission. We've been on the front lines of this for well, many, many decades and preserving the last remaining habitat on our planet. The Panda logo, one of the most recognized brands in the world and one of the largest conservation organizations globally. Uh, sadly, we are losing in our efforts to save nature. The evidence shows that human impact on our planet is not up for debate. We can take pictures of forests and grasslands, and we see that each year there is less and less habitat for nature. What is clearly not understood or recognized is the cause for this loss or of rainforests and habitat like grasslands and the collapse of ocean and freshwater ecosystems. When we lose these precious habitats, we lose them to agriculture, the food production of fuel, food, and fiber. It is our food system that is responsible for upwards of 70% or more of the biodiversity loss on our planet. 
If we are to create the sustainable and regenerative future, we have to recognize that our food system and agriculture is the major contributor to climate and biodiversity loss issues. It therefore becomes an imperative to address the inefficiencies in our food system and agriculture systems. And that's why we care so deeply about an issue like food loss and waste. With agriculture impacting so much globally, it's an absolute tragedy that we waste between 30 to 40% of everything we produce. While an estimated, keep this in mind, 800 million plus people globally are food insecure. Furthermore, we know that methane emissions from landfills are the third largest source of methane emissions globally and in the US, go back, and represent an incredible loss of nutrients and raw materials that can be repurposed back into our food system. These are things that just go needlessly into holes in the ground. So in 2016, WWF began the development of our Food Waste Warrior Program, which set out to support efforts to turn the cafeteria into a classroom. Uh, over the last five years, we have tested a number of interventions for school waste reduction. We have worked with dozens of organizations in over 30 states, including Puerto Rico. And in 2009, we published a Food Waste Warrior Report showcasing the many, the many interventions and key learnings that we've had. Our ambition is to see that food system education and foods linked to climate impact becomes institutionalized in K through 12 programs. Curriculum like our Food Waste Warrior program, where students learn about the impacts of the food system by simply becoming aware of how much they waste, should be a fundamental building block for every student in K through 12. Furthermore, investing into this education has the potential to get students excited about the sciences. When students are encouraged to lead and participate in hands-on learning, we excite a potential future for chefs, for farmers, for plant biologists, and for soil scientists. These jobs in the biological sciences will be critical to our future in the 21st century if we are to address the biodiversity and climate crisis. I feel strongly that growing this momentum and creating the cafeteria as a classroom may be one of the most important classes that any student will take. With so much at stake, we can't afford to have future generations uneducated about the food system and its link to climate change. And the best and least confrontational way we have to educate students on the impact of that is to get them analyzing food waste, to be, have them become better leaders on waste reduction in their schools and in their community. Even better, the issue of food waste is an issue we've seen collaboration from Republicans and Democrats on, bipartisanship. Now, how many issues in this from people in this room, can we truly say that there is bipartisan support? I think it's one we should take a hold of. One of the most inspirational stories I'd like to leave you with is work that was led by students in Maryland who organized a postcard writing campaign after being involved with our Food Waste Warrior program. Within just a couple months, students sent over 5,000 postcards to state legislators and were successful in getting new legislation passed to tackle food waste. This to me is truly inspiring. We want to see that more students become leaders and advocates for issues like waste reduction and think establishing the cafeteria as a classroom could be a big catalyst for action. I'm encouraged by future, a future where students and youth engagement are supported. Imagine the story of Maryland being adopted by all 50 states and imagine the types of acceleration of change we could see. It's truly something that gives me hope. Thank you. Thank you, Pete. That was a great presentation. Our fourth panelist is Joanna Pisumier. Joanna is a sustainability analyst for Baltimore City Public Schools. She helped develop and now implement the school district sustainability plan, which aims to increase students' environmental literacy, create healthy school environments, and decrease environmental impacts. Two years ago, Baltimore City Public Schools unveiled two new net zero school buildings as part of their sustainability initiative. And she's here to tell us all about the really cool stuff happening about 45 minutes to the north. So welcome to our panel. I'll turn it over to you. Thank you very much. And thank you to everyone uh, for coming and joining us today. Uh, as you said, I'm with Baltimore City Public Schools right up the road. And just to give you a little bit of context, we are a large urban district. We have almost 78,000 kids. We have about 155 buildings. We have a high needs population. So uh, we have a community eligibility lunch program. So all of our students qualify for free lunch. 
and we have a growing number of English language learners and a majority African American uh, student population. Uh, I'm going to be talking just broadly about three of our sustainability projects that we are working on that are sort of the three main uh, pieces of it. So the first is about our policy and our plan. The second is about the buildings themselves. And the third is about our kids. So the policy was first passed by our board in 2016. And that is a broad document that has a lot of uh, grand goals. And really what the nitty gritty work is left to the sustainability plan, which is a staff level document, and is something that we have worked to uh, meet with lots of different people throughout the district and partners and stakeholders to figure out what are we actually going to be trying to do and how are we going to measure that and how are we going to report on that? Because as a district, if something is not quantified and reported on, it often doesn't happen. So um, these are the six categories of our work and pretty much it really encompasses everybody. So we view it as something that is not just in, you know, I'm based in our operations office, but it's not just an operations program. It really uh, crosses all of our programming. So we try and look at all of our sustainability work through an equity lens. And so we are dealing in Baltimore as we are dealing with in our country and in our state all over with the compounding effects of racism. So one example that it's quite clear in Baltimore is uh, about our tree canopy and our temperatures. So these are three maps of Baltimore City. And the map on the left is our tree canopy. So the darker the green, the more trees there are. The middle map is, our, is a temperature map on a hot summer day. The darker the color, the hotter the temperature. The map on the right is the uh, redlining map from the 1930s. And the uh, purple and colors towards the center there are the areas where uh, homeowners, you know, African Americans were not eligible for home loans. So we now have a situation where people who were not allowed to buy homes now have much hotter temperatures, worse air quality because there are fewer trees. So it's a, a, a process day after day that we are working to combat. And as other panelists have said, we know that zip code is incredibly important for what your health status may be and that these burdens are borne disproportionately proportionately by people of color and lower income people. So in the sustainability world, you'll, you'll hear a lot about the seven generations ahead. And while I think that is incredibly important and we obviously have to be thinking about that, we also need to be talking about today because we have, uh, you know, Bar Baltimore has one of the highest rates of asthma uh, anywhere in the country and drastically higher than anywhere else in Maryland. So as we are building these, the policy and the plan, we are looking to really build a network of people and try to figure out where the overlaps can be and say, we all, each department has its own goals. You know, they're trying to teach math or they're doing the social emotional learning or they are, you know, trying to save energy. But how does that all fit together with sustainability? And we think there's a lot of overlap for pretty much every department across our district. Um, so we have lots of efforts of, you know, supporting our teachers, reducing isolation, sharing best practices, talking to anyone and everyone who are, is at all interested in this work. The second piece is about our buildings. So we have millions of square feet of buildings. We use a lot of electricity. We create a lot of trash. We, you know, we just have a big impact on the earth. So how can we try and reduce that? Uh, as you mentioned, we have two net zero energy buildings. Those are buildings that over the course of a year, as much energy is used in the building is created and generated on site. So we have two buildings that are, have complete solar on the roof and very energy efficient inside. And we are just really excited about them. They opened in 2020, which the timing was a little challenging but they are now operating and certified as net zero. And we really feel like the, the reason we were able to succeed in that is because we had built that foundation and really talked with a lot of people. And then we also just were very lucky. We had great timing that we had two school buildings that we had funding for, but hadn't yet entered design when there was funding available through the state of Maryland. 
We also have a program called the 21st Century Schools Program. We have uh, some of the oldest school buildings in the state of Maryland. So we have been uh, very fortunate through a lengthy advocacy effort through Baltimore City and the state. We're able to, to raise about a billion dollars in bond funds and renovate completely or build new 28 schools. So those schools have a number of green features. They're, they're built to the U.S. Green Building Council's LEED standards. And so those are just beautiful buildings that are wonderful. And literally being able to see out the windows to you know, green spaces outside is a huge improvement than, than some of our buildings are facing. We have, however, 100 plus buildings that are not net zero and have not been fully renovated. And so we are working to improve those of you know, how do we get better systems, better controls? How can we uh, help people modify their behaviors of turning off lights, getting our kids into recycling programs, um, using less toxic cleaning supplies, sort of all of these different things that can help improve the experience for our staff and our students, because we know that uh, those better spaces not only will save us money, but they will result in better satisfaction for the teachers and better outcomes for our students. The third piece is about our students. That's why we exist, is because of our students. So we are trying to have experiences embedded into our curriculum so that you do, it's an equitable experience regardless of where you go to school. Much of our past has been, some kids got a great uh, experience. They got to go to our farm. They got to go out to the bay. They got to do cool hands-on environmental activities if their teacher thought that it was important or if their principal thought it was important. What we're trying to do is say, this needs to be in every school in certain grade levels and embed it in. And we're fortunate in that Maryland has a, a watershed requirement that in elementary school, in middle and in high, students have to have one watershed experience. So those are in fifth grade, sixth grade, and ninth grade biology. And we team up with some great partners, uh, Towson University, the Aquarium, Chesapeake Bay Trust, Chesapeake Bay Foundation, lots of different organizations to help us do that. And we're making uh, progress. It's a, it's a big, big project. The other piece is trying to figure out ways that we can connect people to the environment in a joyful and inspirational way. So learning about water quality, turbidity, and dissolved oxygen, and the water cycle is extremely important, and we want to do that. But we also have a lot of kids who, back to the earlier slides, their access to public space and outdoor spaces is, has been very restricted. We have many kids who haven't been to the harbor in downtown Baltimore, which if you ever hear about Baltimore, you hear about the harbor. We have a lot of kids who are not allowed out to play outside when they are at home due to violence and other problems in their neighborhood. So how can we create some experiences that help to say this is, can be a beautiful, wonderful thing to be outside and that that's sort of the first step in appreciation and then protection and involvement in this work. And so we have been working hard on trying to promote our outdoor spaces outdoor lunch during COVID. We invested a lot of money in picnic tables and trash cans and cushions and things to try to get people to be outside. And then teacher comfort with being outside. We also have teachers who are nervous about runners, you know, kids taking off in all directions when outside. How do we work with them on training and comfort levels and sort of building this piece up? And so that's, those sort of two things together of in the formal environmental education side, coupled with the joy and inspiration side, we can hopefully build that, that connection and that uh, care about the environment. So that's a, a summary of our work and I welcome any questions that people have. Thank you very much. Awesome, that was a great, uh, great presentation and congratulations. And if anyone knows how schools get built in Maryland, have two net zero schools online in the same year. Um, yeah, I hope everyone bought lottery tickets that day. Um, that's great. Um, we are just about to transition to our questions and answers. Um, for folks in our online audience, uh, if you have a question, you can send us an email. The email address to use is ask at esi.org. That's ask at esi.org. You can also follow us on Twitter at esi online and send it to us.
that way. Uh, one of my colleagues, I think it's Savannah because she's holding the microphone, uh, will be wandering around. If anyone has questions from the audience, please either catch my eye or catch her eye or raise your hand or, or otherwise make it known that you have a question and we'll, we have a, a great amount of time for Q&A. But before we get to questions, we have a very special guest uh, with us. Uh, we have Joe Ambrosio. He is the president and CEO of Unique Electric Solutions. Joe, welcome to our briefing today. Joe is the person who made or helped make our repowered electric school bus tour possible. And so I wanted to introduce him, give him a few moments to say a few words. Uh, if there are any technical questions that come up during the school bus or during the Q&A, Joe's here. Otherwise, uh, we, uh, we can talk about it more when we get to the bus. But Joe, thanks for your help uh, with our school bus today. Super well, cool. Uh, thank you, Dan. Appreciate uh, the invitation today and being part of this uh, exciting climate action uh, <clears throat> uh, briefing. So uh, our company is a technology and manufacturing company, so we build the engines that will make the buses and trucks go down the road. So we can put them in new vehicles, like we do for UPS, uh, and we can put them into existing vehicles that are in our school bus fleet. So we're currently doing 25 school buses in New York City, and we're working with the largest uh, school bus operators in the city, which represent about 12,500 buses. So one of the companies that we're working with is Logan Bus. Uh, they were a pioneer. Uh, and uh, uh, we did the, an initial five buses for them, and we literally ripped one of their buses out of their hands on Friday, uh, and we drove it down uh, for the event today. So, you know, we'd love for you to come outside and take a look. But we just want to uh, we want to emphasize the fact that if you're looking at 500,000 buses, right, and we want to do this really, really quickly, uh, repowers are a really good way to get there. Obviously, we're biased in saying that, but. Uh, this occurs with buses and trucks and marine vehicles, airplanes. So it's a, it's a technology that's well understood uh, and that really can help uh, move the industry forward uh, and get us on the right track as soon as possible. So again, I appreciate the, the opportunity. Thanks, Joe. It's okay to be biased when you're right. So um, we'll, we'll allow that. Um, let's get into the questions and answers. Um, anyone from our, I have lots of them and I can just roll through them, but I wanna make sure that our folks in our in-person audience today, if there are any questions, I'll give you all the first, uh, first opportunity to raise your hands, and then uh, I'll be taking the questions from the online audience as well. All right. Oh, we have one. Savannah will bring you the mic. Uh, hello, can you guys hear me? Okay, hi. So my question is um, directed to um, Ms. Joanna. So I wanted to know, um, you were talking a little bit about um, school requirements um, in the curriculum. And so my question was, how are you attempting to uh, incorporate this curriculum in schools that don't have those requirements? Um, and just uh, if you can give us a little bit more insight of like specific cases or things that you've worked on. Sure, thank you for the question. So in Baltimore, we have a, um, both traditional schools and charter schools, but the default is that they're centralized curriculum. So there is, for example, the science office puts together the, the fifth grade science units and unit five is about the bay and teachers are expected to teach that. And as part of our annual training, there are a number of professional development days over the course of a year. We always offer training about you know, how to teach that unit, just like any other unit in the curriculum. Charter schools have more flexibility to teach the curriculum that they want. And so some choose to either follow the traditional city schools curriculum or they may adapt or take pieces from it, but they need to follow the state standards. So um, I will say that on this, those watershed units, it really still, we, deal, we, we still do unfortunately have variety of how it's being implemented. With this many schools, there's bound to be, you know, different uh, interpretations of things, different time spent on it. Um, students are at different, uh, have different needs, and so there's differentiation. So trying to figure out how we help those teachers implement the, those units in an engaging, fun way that they feel comfortable teaching. So for example, the ninth grade biology, we, had, uh, we have 12 teachers who did three days of training this summer and are working with our partners right now to actually go out to sites to uh, do water quality sampling. And, and then there's an action project associated with that. So students need to 
decide either as a group or small groups on something that they are going to take tangible action on to improve the watershed? Great question. While the next person is thinking of their question, I'm going to ask one to the whole panel. And Laura, I'm going to start with you and then we'll kind of roll down through the list. Um, Sue, your presentation talked a little bit about the Infrastructure and Investment Jobs Act, Inflation Reduction Act. Um, Laura, what are some of the additional steps, now that we have these, um, these new investments uh, enacted, what are some of the steps that we need to take, the really critical steps, to help ensure that those investments are delivered to communities? And for, for the congressional staff in our audience today, what should they be looking at in terms of sort of implementation by the agencies, and what should they be thinking of in terms of oversight? Yeah, um, thank you. Um, I think one of the things that's really critical is there's a lot of opportunity in both uh, the Bipartisan Infrastructure Bill and IRA to really advance this in schools. But the law is complicated, and especially for people on the ground. And so one of the big things that I think is needed right now is real clear explanation. I mean, if you're working in a school district and you have to follow what the opportunities are with the, you know, Treasury and EPA and energy, it can be a lot and you might miss your opportunities. Um, but if there is a way to be really explicit around saying, oh, well, schools, here are all the opportunities that you can take and here's the way that you can access these grant programs, these tax credits, um, whatever it may be, can be a really powerful tool is just elevating that opportunity that's there. Um, and, and I will continue to say, I think the recommendation in our action plan is really central, is pushing school districts to really think about this in a robust way on planning. So they're asking those questions around, what do I need to do in terms of mitigation? What do I need to do in terms of adaptation? What do I need to do in terms of education? Um, and, and recognizing the opportunity to connect to those different federal resources, state resources and opportunities in a centralized kind of plan for, based on the local needs and assets can be a real um, opportunity for Congress going ahead is really thinking about how you can support school districts and knowing the opportunities around climate action planning and knowing the opportunities that the federal government has provided. Sure, I'll second all that. Um, I mean, two great pieces of legislation, but lots to um, work through. Um, and so certainly, you know, as it's contacted, which I know, you know, does happen, um, being able to provide that information back um, and, and be thinking about that access. Um, you know, at WRI, we're, of course, trying to add to that as well and, and provide technical assistance and information, um, uh, you know, in particular around electric school buses and the opportunities there so that, um, it is easy to see, for instance, we put together a two-pager um, on um, the, the tax rebate provision within IRA, and I think we have that link to um, uh, the, the EESI information here. Um, so, I, you know, I think, again, um, uh, making sure that there's education and, and, and thinking about um, uh, how to just, you know, as, as you're out um, maybe making visits, you know, in the field, um, you know, being there to, to serve as a resource um, and thinking about the opportunities to um, have um, just greater awareness and, and, you know, think about breaking down those barriers between the different pots of funding as well. So um, it's great to have, you know, this problem, if you will, um, for the next however many years um, the, the funding is out there, um, but definitely want to spend it, you know, spend it well and spend it wisely. Pete, happy to turn it over to you for your comments. Uh, I mean, the one thing that I think we have to be aware of in schools is that we, especially for programs like I mentioned, the, the Food Waste Warrior Program or getting curriculum and getting education is, we tend to put a lot of things on the backs of teachers and just expect teachers to be able to do everything for us. And I think one of the things that is nice, the, the House bill that Representative Pingree mentioned is, the small amount of funding for something like the food waste education and awareness, what that does is it tries to instill grants and money that can go into schools so that somebody could be an educator who's getting a stipend, maybe. A small amount of money like you would get in just hosting a sports team or being a coach, but doing that for something like the sustainability program or a food waste program. Just that little bit of a stipend and figuring out how to distribute money, I think goes a long way because there has to be some incentive for the teachers and for those school programs to be 
moving every single year. And, and so I think, you know, that the House bill that Representative Pengree introduced is a great start. It gets us moving in that direction of finding incentives to get teachers to have an incentive to do programs like this and to keep them moving, moving year over year. And from the perspective of a school district, what are the critical steps for implementation? So I agree with what several co-panelists have said of sort of the amount of information that is coming at us as a local school district is a lot. So there's the uh, city, there's the state, there's the federal, there's just all sorts of things at all times. And so having partners who can help interpret that for us and provide us with either like, are you, did you see this? Like, make sure this didn't slip by you to technical assistance. So for example, WRI is helping us navigate the EPA application for the electric school buses and figuring out how best that could work because our team knows how to run buses and you know internal combustion engine and this is brand new and there's a lot of pieces to it. Um, and and then on the implementation level, I also agree, you know, there's just, it's a busy day. Like I talked to a teacher the other day who was really excited that she had the highest turnout so far for the environment club in her high school. But she's like, can you help me figure out what to do with them? Like, I, it's just overwhelming for me to think about another, like planning for another thing for, you know, every Tuesday and Thursday afternoon with 15 kids. And so, again, having partners to help us do that and, and recognizing and supporting our teachers in doing that and paying them or compensating them in some way and recognizing them is very, very important. Of course, please. Um, one more thing that I think is really important to think about with implementation of these laws is, you know, the it's really putting in place a transition of our economy, a transition of our economy to clean, renewable energy, a lot of opportunity there, but it's going to require a workforce to actually um, power those jobs in a clean economy. And that's another place where our schools can really help is career and technical education programs. So I think one thing um, that Congress can think about doing, ensuring that those laws are implemented effectively in our economy is actually driving towards success is helping support and invest in career and technical education programs that will position people for success in the clean economy ahead too. Thanks. Um, Joanna, I think we'll start with you and then maybe work backwards. Um, something that all of you mentioned in your presentations is, um, is equity and ensuring that these investments are distributed in an equitable way. But um, what does that actually look like? How, what are some steps that, from your perspective, maybe Baltimore City's school districts is taking to ensure um, that these benefits are in fact distributed equitably and the communities, the frontline communities, the environmental justice communities that um, you know, have been left out according to your maps um, are catching up. And then we'll hear from Pete and from, from Sue and from Laura. So we try and be as, an intent, as intentional as possible. And I think trying to move away from a system of here's an opportunity, whoever raises their hand for it, come and take it. Because we find that the schools that have the parents who can come in and volunteer and the parents who can come to the PTO meetings and the parents who can write to the city council people and the parents who can do this and that are the ones who then respond and help, you know, may go to the principal or the teacher and help do that. So the first step is trying to be more thoughtful about here is an opportunity, how do we get it into the hands? How do we remove as many barriers as possible so that more people can get to it? So for example, the stipends to teachers, we, uh, we have sort of a credit system that we can give to teachers and that grew out of just that, that we had the teachers, the only teachers who were leading the green team clubs were the ones who could stay after because they didn't have a second job or they didn't have to pick up their kids or whatever it was. And so having some compensation in that is, is one piece. Um, and then I think looking at our city and, you know, looking at demographics for different schools and what they may need and different school, different schools may need different things. And it's not necessarily a one size fits all opportunity that we may be sharing with all schools and, and making sure that we can adapt our programming to what an individual school may need. Uh, I'll just add that when you look at analyzing and having education around the food system and programs around things like food loss and waste, 
Um, I mean, you're, you're, you're having to expose the fact that most, a lot of students, this may be the only meal that they have during the day is at school, right? And so you start to develop programming within a school that is looking at developing share tables or um, making sure that surplus food maybe goes to the community and is absorbed as a donation. And a lot of these things, actually, it's policy and laws that can get in the way. I think a lot of schools probably still think it's not legal to donate food from the school unless there's proper food safety uh, as, as part of the program. And that's just not true. Like you can have donation programs, you can have share tables. And so part of this curriculum and, and by putting these things out there on food loss and waste, is just an, a general education and it, it strives to make the community more food secure in a lot of ways. Uh, and, and so I think that's a really great thing when we look at equity and, and how this can balance itself nicely across the country. Thank you. Um, I think I mentioned that our our effort um, around electrification for school buses is deliberately focused on equity, and um, that is a big <laughs> um, that is a big task. But um, we're kind of approaching it in a couple ways that I think make sense um, in this context, where we're really you know looking internally in terms of who are we partnering with, what are the community groups on the ground that we're supporting, because um, those are the voices that are really going to be important to to supporting um, um, different groups within the community um, and taking a lot of time to think about what our what our equity values are. Um, we're also prioritizing all of our technical assistance around underserved communities. So going to those communities first um, and working with them and trying to hear from them what their needs are um, and then trying to um, encourage policymakers to do the same in terms of their technical assistance, in terms of their funding. Um, and then I'll mention also, I'm glad Laura brought it up, around workforce. We think there is a huge opportunity um, for developing a, the workforce of the future and providing those opportunities um, within the classroom or technical training. And so we actually have a project we're working on directly with manufacturers who often provide some of this training as well, as well as a number of community colleges and community groups. And again, that's a really key part for policymakers well. And, and you know, some of what we've seen in some of the programs thus far um, do a great job of allowing for school districts or other to be able to fund some of those um, workforce or training um, elements. So those are important to continue the support for those also. Yeah, and I just think, um, you know, to add, I think from the federal policy perspective, there's obviously prioritization of funding, which can be a huge way of helping to advance equity. Um, but I think we also get into the mindset a lot of times is talking about a deficit model when we're talking about equity. And we also need to recognize assets that communities bring to the conversation. And sometimes um, one of the big things that the federal government can do is recognizing in grant programs the need to include community engagement and ensuring that that community engagement is representative um, of often under-voiced uh, members of the community as well. And that's the way that you're going to ensure that any solutions that are advanced within that community also meet the community needs, recognize how climate change is impacting that community or how education inequities are impacting that community. So coming at a mindset of both prioritization and ensuring community engagement can be two big things that um, you know, from the federal government can be done. Thanks. And we have a question from our audience. You hold the distinction of the first in-person ESI briefing question in two and a half years. You get number two. So we're really eager to hear what you have to say. Okay, hello. Thank you all for being here. Um, I graduated from the University of Vermont last year and we had some pretty successful campus-wide um, sustainability efforts, um, like required composting in our dining halls. Um, we had a ban on plastic water bottles. And um, our buses, I don't think they were completely electrified, but they were um, low emissions, not completely diesel. Um, so my question for any member of the panel is, do you think any of your um, action plans or programs could be implemented at the collegiate level, um, especially considering that um, our universities are big institutions that have large impacts on the environment. Yeah, this will be a free-for-all. Whoever would like to jump in. Um, so one of the things that we just did actually last week uh, was announce that we're, we're expanding our work from K-12 climate action to now this, this is Planet Ed. Um, and including three new, three new buckets of work. We're actually 
um, working on an early years climate action plan that is considering the needs of um, younger children from zero to eight and how we need to think about taking climate action there. We're developing an initiative in higher education that will also model what we've done with K-12 and thinking about what's the unique role of higher education in taking action on climate change. Um, and we also have a work that we're developing around children's media and how children's media can help teach solutions as well. So yes, absolutely, Higher Guide can. And stay tuned. Uh, we're working on that too. Anyone else would like to jump in? Uh, I'll just add, I mean, we get that question a lot, and, and so does um, EPA. Um, so, you know, another yes. Um, um, and when you think about school buses and fleet opportunities, um, what we hope is that some of what we're seeing already um, in the in the K through 12 world, you know, can really help inform that process um, and just continue to build that. So um, I think it's exciting that um, there are many colleges and, and other institutions as well, you know, that, that play a part. Um, you know, you can think about churches, you can think about Head Start programs. Um, there's a whole array that are involved in that. And I'll just add on the cafeteria side, what's really uh, hopeful to me is that you have companies like Sodexo, Aramark, Compass, they're all really embracing the issue of food waste for sure. But I think they're also taking it to the next level and looking at planet healthy diets. How do we actually start to change some of the recipes and the, the food we're actually serving? Not just reducing waste, but looking at how that can be more climate friendly. And I, I think it's really encouraging. There is a large network of universities that are have climate action goals, and so there are there is a very robust set of work going on there. And I cannot speak uh, very much about it, but other than I know that some of that does trickle down to us. And in Baltimore, um, all of the universities in town uh, have programs and are working towards climate action goals, and so it's inspiring. and And we have been talking about ways we might be able to work together more. And I suppose this year's student in Baltimore is next year's university freshman. So my guess is that it trickles up a little bit, which would be kind of exciting. And I'll actually say that then you're our next teacher. So we're starting to also get teachers who say, what? Like, why isn't my school recycling? Like a, a generation of people now who have grown up doing this and they are now in the classroom and, and are surprised and upset and want to uh, carry this on and help to educate and inspire the, the kids. And I think we have a question. Uh, I'll come to you next, but we'll go to the back first. OK. Um, I'm actually, a, I was a Baltimore City Science teacher for 12 years, so worked with some of the programs that Joanna mentioned. I'm just here for a year. I'll probably be back. Um, my question, when I think about a lot of the students that I've taught, I think about where they're going. Um, and the programs that they get to do, like they inspire, it engages them in these things. Um, do you see an opportunity to take some of those and, and create uh, either mentorship opportunities or kind of direct that interest into kind of a pipeline into internships, mentorships, and jobs? Thank you for your service. We'd love to have you back if you change careers again. We work a lot with our college and career readiness office. We have a work-based learning program. And so that is something that we have been working to try and connect to that too. So for example, our automotive pathway, we are now starting to have conversations about how does that look for training our kids on how to maintain electric vehicles. Uh, we have a lot of gardens and, you know, urban farms and how can we get kids out doing internships and summer jobs. Um, we have a youth work summer employment program through the mayor's office and trying to see if we can do, you know, opportunities, have partners participate in that program so that our kids can get paid for those summer jobs doing, you know, whatever it may be in the green and the blue economy. So I think there's a lot of opportunity there and is something that we're hoping to be able to dedicate more time and resources to in the coming years. Other panelists, please feel free to weigh in. I just wanna add that one of the things we've looked at is actually trying to pair up high school students as mentors to elementary school kids. I mean, for me growing up, some of the coolest people were the high school kids, right? When you're in elementary school. And you know, if we look at curriculum and things like stipends, maybe we can start directing some of those stipends to the high school students themselves as a part-time job, them being mentors and educating elementary school. And I, I think that's a fun intersection in a way of building that mentorship and those programs uh, if we have the funding to do that type of thing. Absolutely. 
And that brings us to our next question. Hi there. Um, I was wondering if someone can talk about infrastructure with school buses, because obviously the buses are only one component of it. And I know that the Department of Transportation is approving all of the EV charging infrastructure plans for states. And But as many of you have alluded to, sometimes it can be very difficult to see which pots of money exist and how school district can capitalize on that. And so I'm wondering what you would say to a school district that feels like they can't electrify their buses because they don't have the infrastructure around the schools to run the routes effectively, or they feel they don't have that. I'll try and jump in on that, but others as well, because Joanna, you're going through it directly. Um, I think infrastructure is, is, um, is definitely at the heart of a lot of the challenges. Um, there's many of them, but you know, we're seeing a pathway forward um, in terms of the funding part of it, which is one part. Um, we do have some money through, I say we, but the school districts do have some funding through the Clean School Bus Program that um, provides, you know, a portion of that. Um, it may not be enough to cover all of the costs. Um, and then the NEVI program that's through DOT that I think all the plans or initial plans just got approved today um, are another part of a broader infrastructure investment um, some of which will be helpful to, to, to school buses. Um, you know, those are all located, you know, not often in a publicly accessible way. So, you know, there's some, there's some um, crossover there. But um, I'd say the first thing we say to school districts is um, go talk to your utility because um, they are critical to building out that infrastructure. Um, they need to be part of it regardless of whether or not they might also be able to provide some um, incentives and some funding depending upon where they are and you know what they've got to prove so um, you know it's happening um, but it's really critical to do that planning um, and it does take you know it does take some time to think about where to locate chargers what kind of chargers um, you know most school buses are you know this is why they're an attractive electrification um, case is that they're, they're sitting there overnight unused great time to plug in low cost you know very accessible energy um, and so you know there there's a lot of options that you can put into place in terms of the type of charging that you need but um, you know also need to build a lot of um, uh, uh, infrastructure uh, you know a, a lot of wires that need to be laid as well you know particularly when you think about getting to scale so um, it's definitely something to not uh, to not lose sight of, um, but not lose sleep on, I guess is maybe how I'd put it. You know, there's there's a lot of programs out there and and definitely utilities as like a, a key connector on that, if you will, um, you know, are part of that as well. Um, on the back of this flyer is one of the QR codes, is a case study from Colorado uh, about their transition to electric school buses. Um, that could be a resource for you to take a look at. And then we did a briefing in June, I think, maybe June, about electric vehicle charging infrastructure build out as one of our big swings. So the, how do we get this thing to scale? How do we go from gas stations on every you know, other corner to electric vehicle charging infrastructure that can support an all electric fleet, or at least an all electric light duty fleet? Go ahead. And our uh, utility infrastructure team <clears throat> just whispered in my ear to say that we have a power planner guide that we have developed for school districts specifically on that. So again, another resource to, to look at for, for folks who are interested. Joanne? The bus is a huge expense and has been the, the main barrier, but you're right that once there is either a commitment to spend that money or as we're hoping for an EPA allocation, uh, some money does come for the charging equipment, but that, like the EPA money, for example, will not pay for the infrastructure from the pole to the pad, right? It only covers once the, the electricity is already on our, on our property. And we need to put in a new meter because it's a huge amount of electricity. So just as you said, we are talking with our utility, trying to figure out they're, they're very interested in working with us. The new re, you know, line of uh, electricity customer coming down the, the way. Right so far, we have not figured out what that that support might look like, but we are hopeful, and it it requires both technical knowledge that we don't necessarily have because we haven't done this before, and just the dollars to actually install all of that equipment and then maintain it over the course of the year. I will also say that we also have a fleet of vehicles for our staff. 
a lot of staff use their own vehicles, but we do have some of our maintenance team and others who have vehicles. And so we are also trying to figure out electrifying those cars and where would we put chargers for there? And that's a whole nother sort of animal. Um, we've been, I'm gonna pan the room and see if we have any other questions. But in the meantime, we've gotten a lot of great questions online. And I think these might be a little bit more like, like lightning round, but I think they're really interesting. Um, the first, uh, I'm gonna combine a couple of them and ask if any of you have seen in your experience how what we've talked about today has expired either climate leadership or climate activism in the part of students or on the part of students and maybe building on you know the, the presentations about you know students becoming involved in writing postcards to Annapolis um, sort of beyond that any any thoughts on that do, do you want to start I, with you I can say that yes I mean those the the small grant program that we offer to teachers to lead green teams and they they need to have students names written into the application who have helped come up with the idea uh, we have some kids who started that in elementary school. They then carried that into their middle school. They're now, uh, one of them is one of uh, is a paid intern with our Baltimore City Office of Sustainability. She's in high school. We have some college students that are doing this. I think there's huge potential. And even if it's not as uh, clear as that student, I still think that being in this role, and, and to your point, when the high school kids, or even when the seventh graders go around and do a presentation to the kindergartners about recycling and trash and reusing things, that's a, that's a win and for everyone all around. Others, please, Laura. Yeah, I, we heard a lot from students, actually students pushing the activism in their schools rather than the other way around. Um, but we heard from students in Salt Lake that really pushed their school board to develop that 100% clean energy uh, resolution there. And then they were a part of the team to develop the sustainability action plan for their school district um, on equal footing with the other people that were a part of it. There was a student in Miami who had an eighth grade project where she learned about electric school buses and then pushed the school district to um, get some electric school buses there. There was another team in Miami that pushed for composting. So I think this is a real opportunity where students can activate. There was just a student in Boise, Idaho, frustrated with his school board for not passing a clean energy resolution that when he turned 18, he ran and just won a seat on the school board in Boise, Idaho uh, last month. So actually earlier this month. So um, there's a lot of student activism that's, that's leading the charge on this. Pete, Sue, please feel free to jump yeah, in. Yeah, well, We've been inspired by the story of Miami, and that's one of the reasons that we we worked with that school district there is because, you know, when you think about, like, how can one high school student do anything? It was pretty amazing the impact that that um, uh, that she had. Um, the other thing that this makes me think about is um, just the the broader opportunity to think about, you know, kids, and you've got the, um, the cafeteria as a classroom. I mean, just seeing the opportunities to have the entire school and the transformation of that, um, you know, be inspiring. And, um, you know, it's very much, you know, the kids seeing that this is their future, that, that they have a part of and wanting to be more active. And um, for that reason, we included a, a high school student in our advisory council. And so that's kind of our connection to, you know, hear what, what, what are kids thinking and, and, you know, how can they be more involved? And I'll make mine just really quick. It's, I am always amazed at the level of intelligence and capability of even elementary, middle school, and high school students. And to a, to a large degree, all of these programs, it's really a way to educate the adults still. And for, for us to kind of get out of the way and let them enable them to do what they're capable of, because I just find every time they are capable of some really amazing things. Great. Um, another question came in um, that I think could be an interesting lightning round question. That is for um, people who want to learn more about what various states are doing with respect to climate action plans or curriculum resources that, that people might be interested in. Does anyone have any recommendations about where someone might go to learn about how these things are happening in places that maybe haven't been mentioned yet? We've talked a lot about Maryland. We've talked a lot about Miami. But what about other places that might be setting good examples? I'd like to share the resource of the Center for Green Schools. That's the U.S. Green Building Council, and they have a great K-12 program 
of um, both policy documents as well as resources. They run an annual conference and it's a, it's a really great resource. Um, we have a state policy landscape that we did in 2020 uh, that really is just looking at where states are in their policies. It is 2020, um, so two years outdated, um, but it's a good place to start. Um, and I'll put in a plug too, New Jersey is the first state in the country to just start implementing cross-curricular climate change standards. They passed that uh, two years ago, and this is the first year of implementation. So now they're dealing with the build out of supporting educators and actually teaching to these standards. Um, so that's certainly a state to look towards too. Pete, uh, any thoughts on where people may, or go ahead, Sue, please. Okay. Sure. Well, yeah, I was just gonna add, might be more at the, um, the school level really. Um, we've developed a collection of um, really case studies, vignettes about um, uh, school bus adoption, um, in different places. So yes, we have California and and um, some of the places we mentioned, but also what's going on in Canada, which is another big market for that, but places like Missouri, um, just kind of giving a sample of like, there's there's a whole, you know, a whole variety of, of ways that um, uh, that schools are tackling this and, and, you know, part of their broader plans. Thanks to everyone online who submitted questions. Sorry, we didn't get to all of them, but it was a robust Q&A discussion, which is really great. And any other questions in the room? We're going to end up on. We're going to end on time because we have to go visit the bus, and we don't want to keep it up too late. So, um, we'll go ahead and wrap it up. Um, I'd like to say first of all, thanks to four fantastic panelists, Laura, Sue, Pete, and Joanna. Thank you so much for joining us today on this panel to talk about catalyzing climate action in schools. It's excellent presentations. Um, I also like to say a special thanks to Representative or Chairman Scott, who uh, is hosting us today, helped us get this amazing room with a picture of uh, George Miller behind us. I'd um, like to say thanks to Representative Paul Tonko for uh, helping us secure a location for the school bus visit, thanks to him. Uh, and thanks to Shelly Prangree for joining us and providing introductory remarks, talking about her really cool bill uh, to address food waste. Um, means a lot uh, when members of Congress participate in our briefings. Um, also like to um, thank um, Joe for joining us in the room and uh, means a lot for you to be with us today. And thanks also uh, to Mike, who we'll meet in a few minutes uh, at the bus. Um, thanks to Sue and the gang at WRI for all of their logistics and moral support getting the bus, uh, which was no simple feat, but we managed um, to do it. So thanks very much uh, for that. I'd also like to uh, acknowledge my ESI colleagues for all of their hard work. Dan O'Brien, I don't see him, he's around here. Oh, there he is. Dan O'Brien, Omri, Emma, who's actually off today, uh, but she worked really hard on all of this. Allison, Anna, Savannah. Special thanks to Molly. I don't see Molly, but Molly was the person coordinating with the Sergeant at Arms and the Capitol Police <laughs> to actually figure out where this bus was gonna be. And it was she just joined us over the summer. So this was not just her first briefing, but her first in-person briefing. And it's, you know, it's it's an experience to go through when you're working on your first one. Um, I'd also like to uh, share uh, thanks to our interns, Alina, Nick, and Shreya, who's joining us in person today as well. Thanks for all of your really, really hard work. Also, shout out to my man, Troy, for helping us with all the great videography and making us all look and sound as, as good as we can do, uh, at least naturally. Um, and um, before we take off for the bus, my colleague Dano is gonna put up a survey link. Uh, for those online, you can go ahead and click. For those in the room, um, hopefully it's not too much to type in. If you take a few moments, I think it's like literally two minutes, uh, but if anyone has any feedback you'd like to share uh, about how we've done coming back to being in person, if there's any issues you had with the webcast, audio, video quality, any comments uh, generally about the program, ideas for future uh, topics we might cover, we read every response. Uh, and so it means a lot to us if you take a moment to share that feedback. We will conclude. We are exactly on time. Uh, folks uh, who would like to go visit the bus will go over together and have a chance to chat. Uh, to everyone else in our online audience and for those in our in-person audience who can't join us, thanks for coming today. And uh, we'll hopefully see you back online on October 12th for the first of our COPtober briefings. Uh, and that is going to be key findings from the newest global assessment report on climate change. You can visit us online at www.eesi.org to sign up for that and also to subscribe to our biweekly newsletter, Climate Change Solutions. Thanks, everybody. Hope everyone has a good rest of your Wednesday. <laughs>